The Unshackled Waves, episode 157. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Uh, now, while we were at the uh, No Snowflakes pub night with RV Yemeni and Sydney Watson, we met a uh, rising star in the uh, alternative uh, media scene, the, the young conservative who's with me in the studio. Hello. How are you going? Good, thanks. Now, your uh, Facebook uh, page where it's it's mainly you doing rants uh, rants in the car, you assure us that uh, f- uh, when you're driving it's all it's all safe? Yep, it is. It's absolutely, it's all hands-free. So, yeah. Now, your page was only established on uh, May 25, but you've already got uh, 3,000 likes on Facebook, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, about, about 3,400 or so now, yeah. And are you surprised by just how it's grown in what's been about, what, two weeks? Yeah, well, I think um, mainly a lot, a lot of the following comes from a couple of key videos where the, it's gotten a lot of shares. Like I made a video um, uh, about all the foreign aid that we're giving away and the fact that um, there's still over 100,000 people a night sleeping on the streets um, each night. And I think that hit a nerve with quite a few Australians. And that's been shared about... Oh, I think 60,000 times now. So, yeah, I think that's partly the reason why it's grown. A lot of people have seen that particular video. So, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're certainly, I, I think, going to go a, a long way, given that you've got such a, a, a following after a short time. Now, you're called the, the Young Conservative. People say you you look very young. How yeah, old are you? I'm 19. 19. Yeah. So, so you're an adult. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm an adult technically, yes. <laughs> mm. Now, obviously, uh, a lot of uh, young people, uh, the stereotype is, is that they're, they're of the left when they're young. There's that famous expression, if you're not a socialist uh, when you're 20, you've got no heart. If you're uh, uh, still a socialist when you're 40... You've got no brain. Yeah. <laughs> now, h- how did you come to conservative values so young? Um, well, I think it's sort of... I've always held these sort of um views since i was quite young since i was maybe about 13 or so but um this sort of s- cultural marxist politically correct kind of status quo that we got going on at the moment that sort of hit a nerve with me when i was about 16 a few years ago um uh you know, with, with, uh, I think the first thing that started off for me actually was I used to use Tumblr a bit when I was younger <laughs> and, um, uh, I saw it, it was, that was sort of the first in about 20, 2013 or so was the first sort of, um, taste I got of all this new gender politics and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what got me started. Like, this is crazy. And it's sort of just grown since then. And I've become quite active in the past few years or so. So, um, yeah, basically it's just my common sense really that got me to where I am now. Now, obviously, you're you're here in Melbourne. Did yeah. you go to school here as well? No, no, no. I, I went to school in Perth. I'm originally from Perth. And um, uh, that, you know, th- this sort of thing that's going on at the moment, all of these, all this political correctness isn't so, it doesn't manifest itself so much in Perth, but over here in Melbourne, I can really see the difference, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, a lot of people do say that when they, when they come here. Yeah. Uh, I, I get quite sick of uh, fr- uh, friends when I t- tell them uh, I'm living in Melbourne like oh poor you <laughs> yeah people have said the same thing to me as well I think oh gosh do you have to identify identify as a different gender or something I think, oh, well not quite but <laughs> uh, 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 it's not that bad it's not that bad yeah no I can I can say that it's not as bad as they say but it is kind of bad <laughs> Now, uh, a lot of your videos, they're, they're short uh, rants, as we established, uh, just in the car. So uh, I thought it'd be good, uh, uh, while I've got you here, so people can get to know you a bit more. What are the, because uh, you're obviously uh, Gen X, which is the, the up and coming yeah. uh, generation. I'm a bit older, I'm Gen, Gen Y. Uh, what are the, the type of issues that matter to young people today? Well, I think um, a lot of it to do at, at the moment in, in this day and age, in 2018, I think the issue of free speech is a very big one, especially on university campuses and in the media and whatnot. Um, you know, like for, for example, uh, in uni, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of sort of left wing clubs. There's the Young Labour, which is quite po uh, quite popular at my uni, and there's a lot of um, socialist and further left groups as well. And they have a very large platform to speak on because um, uh, basically that's the status quo at the moment. Is you know this this whole this whole idea of everybody um, is oh, I don't even know how to put it into words, but you, you know what I mean in saying that the left has got a much bigger platform to stand on, whereas conservatives and people of the right wing are often silenced for um, saying their mind on on certain issues, like such as like the gay marriage debate. The no vote was um, quite suppressed, whereas the yes vote was sort of saying like, oh, you know, this is the way this is the way it must be, and if you speak out, then um, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, that sort of thing. And it's, I mean, not 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 specific just to that, but all the issues that surround the whole uh, leftist narratives of, uh, you know, racism and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how to put it into words, but like, yeah, basically I think that conservatives and right wingers are often suppressed a little bit in terms of what they can and can't say. Well, that's why the, the yeah. pub night last Friday was so good. There was, yeah. I had so many conversations, and I'm sure you did as well. Uh, a lot of people came their own saying, I'm glad I'm finally among like-minded people. Yeah. I feel that I can't yeah. be myself at, at work or amongst friends. Yeah, I mean, like, I've, I've had debates with people in, um, in my uni classes, which has often um, ascended into shouting matches, which is... A little bit of a, a little bit of an icon of the left, really. You know, they they shut down debate in in favour of feelings and not offending and that sort of thing. And I actually had someone who I don't really speak to in one of my uni classes come up to me and say, "Wow, you know, I I kind of think the same way as you, but I sort of think if I speak out, they're just going to attack me." I'm like, "Well, that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly how people are." So, there is uh, yeah. uh, this uh, line that, that's put out there. Uh, uh, Paul Joseph Watson, I think, started it. Yeah. Uh, cons conservatism great guy, great guy. is yeah. the is the new uh, counterculture. Is yeah. that w would you say that's largely true? And just young people, they just have a hard time finding their voice on the issues. You know, I counterculture. I sort of use a different term. I don't think it's even counterculture. I think it's just um, a lot of people have got their own. Um, uh, idea of what common sense is and what um you know what 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 the world actually i think it comes out comes down to perspective so uh people like paul joseph watson you know he'll he'll make arguments about like say black lives matter and he'll say oh well, you know they're they're not a they're not a human rights group they're a black supremacist group and they perpetuate a victimhood narrative and all this sort of stuff whereas other people say well no they're freedom fighters and they're standing against institutionalized racism and all that sort of stuff. So again, I think it comes down to perspective a lot of people, with a lot of people, so. Now, uh, your Facebook page is called The, the Young Conservative. Yep. Now, obviously, conservative is a broad uh, term, yep. which uh, a, a lot of uh, different uh, f people from ideological backgrounds adopt. Uh, what does uh, being a conservative mean to you? I was kind of hoping you'd ask that, actually, because um, I'm, I'm not a conservative in the definition of conserving the status quo, conserving what already is. I'm, I think the term conservative now covers a much broader scale on the spectrum. Um, so when I say I'm a conservative, I say that I'm conservative in terms of conserving our traditional values, conserving our traditional morality in the face of this new age, politically correct kind of, this is how it is now and accept it. So I'm I'm opposed to the status quo at the moment in favour of what we used to be, if you know what I mean. You know, the traditional Australian values of... No, oh, I, I can't really put a cap on it, but you, you know what I mean when I say I'm a conservative in terms of conserving what it used to be. Uh, um, I'll, I'll put yeah. a, a few more concrete uh, propositions to you. So, for yeah. example, what should be the the size of, of government? Uh, for for example, like, should... Uh, governments be be spending a lot on welfare and other essential services. Where do you stand on sort of those big questions? Well, uh, to, to, if, if you're talking about government spending and that sort of thing, you know, as, as I said, I made that video about how we're giving away so much foreign aid while all these people are sleeping on the streets. I'm absolutely not for a welfare state. You know, I believe that welfare um, should be there to help people get on their feet and nothing more, you know. So... You've got all these homeless people each night who are sleeping rough on the streets, and that can be, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe they were on the ice, maybe they just lost their job or got evicted or they had financial problems. But I think that um, in terms of government spending on things like welfare, it should be to 
get people out of maybe, you know, a little rut that they may be in and help them get into situations where they can get a job, get qualified, get into accommodation. And that's not happening at the moment. You know, if you're, if you're homeless, you, if you, you need a fixed address to be able to, to, um, access welfare payments and that sort of thing where it, but a lot of people who are on the street get no government assistance whatsoever and rely on charity to get by while um, many new migrants, uh, you know, getting zero interest student loans and that sort of thing, um, and all sorts of other uh, welfare payments from the government. So yeah, in, ter in terms of my view on government spending and how um, the taxpayer money is used, I'm against how it is at the moment with giving all this money away to foreign entities while a lot of Australian people suffer and can't access these welfare payments because they have no fixed address, so to say. What about another uh, prompt an issue is what's known as the, the, the nanny state. Should there yeah. be laws regulating our behavior, for example, on uh, smoking when we can uh, go out, whether it's 1 a.m., 3 a.m.? What's your, what's your view on those? Yeah, well, see, in terms of specific laws, like, you know, uh, like, like increasing the taxes on cigarettes, for example, or the lockout laws and that sort of thing, I see where they're coming from. I see the reason behind it. However, I don't agree with it because, uh, I mean, you know, for, for example, if we're talking about the smoking taxes, you know, in, in September, they're going to, cigarettes are going to, the price of cigarettes are going to increase by 12 and a half percent. I think that, um, and, and I'm not trying to sound like a socialist here or anything, but I think that the taxes and the regulations on cigarettes, for example, they're doing that under the guise of, you know, oh, we're going to try and help people stop smoking by increasing the taxes. But if you actually look at the smoking rates, it's only decreased by 0.2% in the past, I think, 15 years or so. So I think that things like the the cigarette taxes and um, uh, the increasing alcohol taxes as well, like a carton is like $52 average now. I think that they are just means of revenue these days, and it's not actually having the so-called in intended effect that the government is saying that they're putting these taxes in place for so oh yeah, yeah. it's blatant uh, revenue grabbing yeah. i mean yeah. it's it's under the guise governments love yeah. it's, to it's just like the speed camera thing you know that they set up like like where i'm from in perth they have mobile speed cameras everywhere you see them in the back of an x trail and you slow down that's it, it's, that's just normal for everyone in perth and you know they say that they're doing it under the guise of stopping people from speeding but then they hide them in little bushes and stuff and it's purely revenue raising so yeah now, probably amongst all the generations, the, the social problems have all been the same. There's obviously, you touched on it, homelessness. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously uh, drug uh, abuse, uh, disadvantage and, yeah. and family b breakdowns. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we keep talking about them, but the, the problem still persists. Mm. Uh, do you have any uh, fresh or... Of what what you see as superior solutions to those? Um, well, I mean, I'm no expert, but you know, if, if we're talking about things like homelessness and drug abuse and that sort of thing, you know, um, uh, I did a video a little while ago. Actually, um, you may have heard about the safe injector yeah. room in um, in North Richmond. Um, you know, I took a little drive around there and I took a little walk around that area of um, Lennox Street near Bridge Street, and um, you know, what, what I think that that injecting room has done, while all good intentions that, you know, they're saying um, it's to prevent overdoses and medical mishaps from the use of needles, like from the 1st of January to the 29th of March this year, there were 37 recorded heroin overdoses in Richmond alone. And so I see the need for something like that. However, I don't think that something like a safe injecting room is actually mitigating the problem properly. It's not... Um, it's not, it's not discouraging people from using drugs. It's not giving them a program where they can get better. It's merely giving them a site where they can do it. And it's created enclaves of drug users around that area. So I think instead of um, attempting to mitigate things like health problems and uh, trying to stop overdoses, while that's good, it's not helping the bigger issue, which is the scourge of drugs in the community. I mean, if they wanted... I think that the Yarra City Council could have put the money into something better, like setting up a rehab or something like that, where people with court-ordered um, uh, addiction programs can actually go and get treatment there within that area. Because we do know, I mean, Richmond's always had its problems, but heroin's been a resurgence in that, has had a resurgence in that area, and we need to do something to actually fix that instead of just mitigating the problem short term, you know? Uh, I've... 
first. I, I want to see on the issue of drugs more community and health-based solutions. Yeah. I don't think law, law enforcement is it has really uh, yeah. helped I don't, I don't agree with you, yeah. help the situation. I mean, I don't want to like obviously these people who you know are on drugs. The the worst thing that we can do for them is give them. Uh, cr criminal uh, convictions, yeah, but but certainly uh, we can make it sh make it so that there's uh, help help available and and take it from. And I think that's what of what a lot of people are moving to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do agree with you that um, you know, locking someone up for being caught with half a gram of heroin and a needle is not the solution. It's only gonna, I mean, that, that's gonna create a bit of animosity in the hearts of the people that are being locked up. You know, it's, mm. it's not actually gonna help them long term. They're gonna get straight out of prison. They're gonna stick another needle in their arm. So. I do agree with you on that, and as I said, I don't have a concrete solution, but my in in my eyes, the money could have been better spent with that injecting room, um, you know, on a program that could prevent them from using the drugs in the first place, should that be possible, so, yeah. And uh, one, of, one of the other issues that I mentioned is uh, family breakdowns, obviously, yeah. divorce is high and prevalent uh, in yeah. our in, in our society and then uh, you would have been hearing about uh, uh, the the abuse of children in uh, aboriginal communities yeah, but but yeah. sadly it's not uh isolated to to those no, uh, no, th no. those communities i mean yeah. even amongst um uh, suburbia there's and so uh, social workers they're so swamped with uh cases that's why you hear hear about uh, uh about uh, children who have been neglected and sometimes even died, but, and there's all been all those notifications, and and it's just so sad. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, um, you know, on the issue of family breakdowns and family violence and that sort of thing, um, I think that um, while while there are a lot of organisations which do try to um, help with that problem and get into, uh, you know, the, the minds of disadvantaged children, trying to get them help and. And all that i do think that social services as well as other mental health services are strained in australia and i i mean i don't have the statistics on government spending on it but from the way i see it it's a bit underfunded and it's a bit stretched like it, where i come from in perth um there's i think there's two um youth mental psych wards in perth and um more than often there's not enough beds available there's not enough spaces available you know uh, kids who are needing treatment are put on big waiting lists and I've had friends who've been in that um, uh, in that cycle as well and only um, last week a um, friend of a friend his younger brother actually committed suicide and he was in and out of that um, he was in and out of that system he was in foster care and that sort of thing and they actually had to put him with a foster family for I think a couple of weeks before he was due to be treated in Bentley Hospital in the southeast of Perth and um, he committed suicide before he was even able to get any treatment. So, yeah, I do think that that needs to change. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty harrowing. Yeah, it was experience yeah. to have, and you're you're exactly right that there's uh, there's not enough focus on uh, uh, as you talked about getting these these beds in in yeah. psych wards because it's not a a sexy po a political issue. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the government needs to stop spending so much on things like foreign aid and other pretty much useless things for Australians and focus more on what really matters. Things like, things like mental health, things like, uh, mitigating problems with, with family violence and the department of child services and that sort of thing, because more often than not, they're failing the families and children of Australia. So, uh, and also we've, we haven't wanted to consider what is, uh, I think we'd all admit an unpleasant solution, which is sometimes removing children uh, mm. from uh, their families and not just moving them from foster home to foster home, but actually mm. adopting them out. Because if you're being raised in a neglected, mm. abusive environment, it's it's often that that's how the children are going to turn out and just the, the cycle of yeah. uh, poverty continues. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you saw um, a little while ago, uh, I think it was on the Today Show, they were talking about um, all the neglect and abuse in a lot of Indigenous communities and how... Um, uh, those children are not being taken out of those circumstances. Sunrise, it was. Sunrise, that's it, yeah. And um, uh, and there was a huge backlash. Um, I forgot who it was, but it was it was a woman. I think she was a political commentator. Uh, Pr uh, Prue McSween. That's it, yeah. And she, she basically suggested that um, uh, Indigenous children be taken out of these communities when there are 
when there's no family mm. who are um, able to look after them and adopted out to white families and they're saying, oh, well, this is going to create another stolen generation and, and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's going to be just like the, the 50s. But I'm thinking like, well, here we are again. Here's the narrative of feelings, you know, fearing, fearing offense over actual logical solutions. You know, they're saying, oh, no, 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 keep these children in these communities where they're being abused and there's all this drug abuse, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that we don't have another stolen generation. And I think that that is absolutely wrong to say that these children should should be kept in these communities where they're being abused out of fear of offending, of, of causing, uh, of creating another stolen generation, so to say. So I mean, yeah. because that is racism. I was saying that yeah. they have to remain in those communities because just because... Because they're Indigenous. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, as you mentioned before, you're at uh, university, which yeah. is basically the, the hotbed of all this uh, cultural Marxism that's coming out, and yeah. it's where we get uh, people like that uh, nappy change consent lady. Mm. Oh, <laughs> for goodness sake, that absolutely boiled my blood. I could not stand that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. obviously, you're, you're there uh, in, in the uh, hotbed there. Um, what what can, what can you tell us firsthand? I mean, obviously, you you mentioned in your in your classes, you're you're getting getting these ideas. I mean, how do you handle it? Um, well, I think I'd, fir I'd first off start by saying the particular university I go to in um, uh, in metropolitan Melbourne, um, it's not. I mean, it, it's got that degree of leftist um, ideology behind a lot of the you know a lot of the lecturers that make it quite clear what they're. Um, what their agenda is when they keep cracking jokes about Trump in every single lecture, for goodness sake. And um, so, look, my, my university in particular is not so bad, but um, I have noticed, like, I've, I've been around Monash and University of Melbourne and that sort of thing, and um, it really does shine out a little bit in terms of the student body. There's always sort of, like, socialist stalls along um, the main bit of Uni Melbourne and posters everywhere. Um and I think I, I do. I do have to say I was in. I did my first year of uni in Perth in Fremantle at um, Notre Dame Uni, and that's a Catholic uni. So it's it's got almost no like on, on the surface you can't really see any sort of like leftist agenda or anything. But then I took a unit where my lecturer was actually handing out flyers to a pro refugee protest, saying, "Oh, I hope to see all of you there." And I was thinking like, "Mate, you meant to give us the content for our unit, not push your political agendas." So. Um, yeah, I'd say on the surface, a lot of these unis um, are quite neutral, are quite impartial, but then you get into the classes and you look at some of the content and you can really tell that the lecturers do have an underlying agenda and the student body quite a lot of the time will just not even pick it up. They'll just take it all in. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like you haven't experienced uh, the worst, such Not as... Not the worst, no, but I have experienced a bit, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> obviously there's been cases of uh, conser uh, conservative students uh, having aggression uh, put towards them. I have had that, yep. And yeah. Yeah, there, then there's obviously the, the no platforming, the, the, the protests yeah. Uh, yeah. outside... Uh, outside speeches uh, by, by conservatives. Yeah, well, actually... Um... Uh, I, I do remember having uh, a debate once in one of my literature classes and um, there was a, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about Heart of Darkness, the novel by Joseph Conrad. It was, it was a novel based around um, the Belgian occupation of the Congo and, you know, all the atrocities that happened there. And there was a Nigerian um, uh, author who was a critic of the book saying, oh, the, um, Th this book shows that Joseph Conrad was a racist and all this sort of stuff because he didn't give the African characters a voice and they were dehumanized, all that sort of thing. And um, uh, my lecturer said, oh, well, um, if this if this author, um, Chinua Akibe, were to say this to me, I don't think I could agree with him, uh, I could disagree with him because I, as a white woman, I just can't do that. And I sort of put my hand up. I said, what does your race have to do with it? And she said, oh, well, um, well, you know, I, I didn't experience any of that. I'm like, well, neither did he. And... This girl in my class, um, uh, she sort of said, oh, well, you, you've got a degree of privilege and, and you're white splaining right now. I said, no, 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 that's an absolutely racist concept. You can't <laughs> say, I said, so, so are you telling me that if one of my, one of my black African friends who agrees on a lot of the same stuff that I do, if he had the same opinion as me, would he be any less right or wrong? Well, yeah, yeah, because he, he's black and you're not, no, 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 you're a racist. 
you're a racist for saying that. That's absolutely illogical. And that got into a shouting match where she actually got up and started acting aggressive. I thought, goodness me, sit down. <laughs> sit down. This is just an opinion. This is a debate. And you're shutting it down by screaming and carrying on. Yeah, the oppression Olympics. It, it, the it oppression get, Olympics, I do like that term. Yeah. Can get quite competitive. Yeah. And I thought, well, look at you. You're white as well. I'm looking at you and I can tell exactly by your nose piercing and your hair exactly what you think about Donald Trump and Tony Abbott. <laughs> so please, please save me the lecture. Use uh, your brain. Yeah. Now, obviously, because your uh, page has gotten so popular and mm. it's, it's attracted uh, detractors, uh, now... Uh, the Antifa style groups, mm -hmm. they've given your page uh, one, oh, the famous one star reviews. They think that's going to ruin oh, you. Oh gosh, I am I cried for an hour when I got my first one star review. Antifa, please, you're hurting me. And obviously the, the most common line of attack they have is that you're a rich, white, privileged uh, boy who's uh, just upset at losing his stuff. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put this forward. I'm my family's not that rich. We're, I mean, we're well off enough to get by. But um, I don't think my race has anything to do with it either. Because, um, again, the, these leftists who are attacking me with this sort of stuff, they're using the same narrative of, oh, you, uh, you're white and, you know, you, you, you are not, you know, poor or anything. So, therefore, you have got more privilege than everyone else and you shouldn't even have a say. And I think that, again, that notion is entirely racist and illogical. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, why just because you're, you know, white and male, yeah. why should your opinion not count? I mean... Well, because because they see white, straight, Christian men as so-called oppressors in the whole scheme of things. So, I mean, you know, because, I'm not going to deny that white people back in, you know, the start of last century, there was oppression on their part and they were mistreating people of colour in... In Western nations, but these days with, uh, you know, anti-discrimination laws where everybody is equal in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of job seekers and in the eyes of the police, all that sort of thing, it's it's an obsolete argument to say that white people are somehow benefiting from some system of oppression because it just simply doesn't exist these days. Yeah, you didn't do it. I didn't do it. We've yeah. we've all grown up. Uh, no, one, no one blames the current Germans for the Holocaust. No one. No one blames. Uh, your everyday American now for the Hiroshima bombing. So why should white people around the world be blamed for, you know, say slavery in the U S that ended in the 1860s? It's just absolutely ridiculous. And we all went to school with, uh, people who are, who are different races. Yep, we, we didn't think a anything of that. We all, we yeah. all got along with well, you them. Know, you know what, actually that, that, that is a very good point. I was just talking with a friend of mine a little while ago about this. Um, I mean, you know, when I was younger growing up in Perth, it, it, it was a little bit multicultural, not as much as it is now, but, you know, whenever I'd uh, come into contact with, you know, say African people or Asian people or, you know, people of different races, I never used to see them as Asians or Africans mm, or yeah. Filipinas or whatever. But these days, um, you know, when you have, say, uh, when, when I see on my Facebook newsfeed where there's like a black activist or someone from Black Lives Matter, I see them as a black person now and you know I, I don't i don't hold any sort of prejudice but i can't help but see people with color now because that is uh that's the sort of status quo that we have now that everyone is separated by race and i think that's just ridiculous because when i was five six years old i saw them as people and they just happen to have different colored skin i never used to think of them as oh that person is black that person is filipino that sort of thing so, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's sad that they've managed to have that yeah. uh, effect. We're, we're going backwards. We're going yeah. backwards is what I think. And of course, that is probably what has led to the, the rise of the, the alt-right uh, yeah. as a reaction to, well, if you're going to, you know, say that, you know, call me like a white, white, evil white person, then I'm going to, you know, identify as that. And obviously, mm -hmm. uh, the alt-right, they've attacked uh, you a bit have, yeah. uh, uh, as well, uh, called you the uh, Zionist shield, part of the, the New World Order, the Illuminati. Oh God. I'm being paid by the Rothschilds, guys. They're putting things in the water. Um, yeah, look, I, I was actually, I'm actually kind of glad you asked, uh, you brought that up because um, I did criticize the alt-right and now... I need to make it very clear that um, my views actually do fall in line sometimes with the alt-right and um, I'm not saying that everybody in the alt-right movement is is damaging the right-wing cause, but I think um, the alt-right today is very different to what it was a, f a couple of years ago. You know, I used to identify myself as alt-right, but um, I think, 
I think probably in the past year and a half, you know, after sort of um, Miley Yiannopoulos' peak in popularity, I think that um, the alt-right has sort of changed a little bit in terms of its image. And there are, I don't like, I don't like admitting it, but there have been a, quite a few self-proclaimed neo-Nazis who have manifested themselves within the alt-right. And I think that that has damaged the image. And as much as my views sometimes do align with the alt-right, I can't label myself as that because not only in the eyes of the media, I mean, I don't care what the left thinks, they're going to label me as a Nazi anyway, but in the eyes of a lot of centrists who might be easily swayed and in the eyes of the media, the alt-right has a label that I can't associate myself with because of the abundance of some neo-Nazis and some other extremists within the alt-right itself. And, you know, when I made that post saying, oh, I think the alt-right has changed and it's damaging to the movement, I did get a lot of backlash from people saying, oh, well, you're a Jew lover, you're a Zionist, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. I understand. I understand the whole elitist Jewish conspiracy thing, but I don't think that can be applied to your everyday Jew, you know? And a lot of people will attack me for saying that even. And I just think it's absolutely, I think it's illogical to, um, apply this globalist Jewish Zionist movement to your everyday Goldenberg and Caulfield. So, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, the alt-right, it does definitely mean now, uh, white nationalists. I, I disagree with you there. I, I disagree with you saying that the alt-right, um, is... Well, oh, that, that, yeah. that, I only say that because yeah. that's what they've told me. They, 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 they actually get upset when I'm labelled alt-right because I, I'm not, yeah. I'm not a white nationalist. Yeah, of, well, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say that there are, there are white nationalists within the alt-right, absolutely, but I wouldn't call the whole, I wouldn't call everybody in the alt-right a white nationalist because I think, um, there's, yeah. yeah, there's the yeah. term alt-light, which is sort okay, of yeah, described no, right the, yeah, yeah. the more civic nationalist where, where, where what we're concerned about is society's values, obviously, yeah. uh, Islam, we, we view as uh, encroaching on the, the type of free society that yeah. we want. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I think bringing up nationalism, I would definitely call myself a nationalist and Look, it, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult topic to explain my views on. I mean, I'm a civic nationalist, okay? Yeah. So I, so I, I believe in, um, you know, Australian culture and preserving that, you know, that, that sort of idea. And I absolutely oppose any sort of ideologies that, that are coming in and trying to change that. I mean, you know, we're seeing, we're starting to see um, enclaves in Western Sydney and Fairfield and Bankstown and even, even in Melbourne in places like Broadmeadows and St Albans and all that. Um, I'm opposed to, I'm opposed to immigration from third world countries because history has proven, I mean, you look at Sweden, you look at Germany, it has proven that a lot of these people coming in from, not, not all of them, but a lot of these people coming in from the Middle East and from other parts of Asia and from Africa, they have problems integrating. It creates issues. I mean, you look at Sweden in 2009, they had roughly 7,000 sexual assaults reported. Whereas in 2016, it was 27,000, I think something like that. And what a Swedish people just committing sexual assaults four times higher than they used to be. Or is it something to do with the fact that they had the highest per capita rate of immigration from third world countries in Europe? Yeah, that's I've seen the the same stats as you, yeah. and it, and it's yeah. people get the wrong idea. Terrific, we're just yeah. we're just looking for somebody to yeah. you know hate. We didn't just yeah. Like, oh, yeah. it's all, it's all. I mean, I I've got that from the left. I mean, I, there's someone who I debate with quite quite frequently, who I know from Perth, who is a raging lefty, and to his credit, I mean, he's the he's probably the only lefty I've ever debated with who actually comes up with fact and reason and logic, and he's presented to me. Um, uh, the the idea that oh no 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 uh, Sweden's Sweden's definition of sexual assault has changed and that's why I'm like okay so so you're seeing four times higher rates of sexual assault like no the legislation it didn't it didn't change the definition it changed a bit of wording well the it's, Swedish yeah. feminists they're they're also out of hand uh, hand as well so maybe yeah. it's a bit of oh both my gosh I mean how how can you how can you call yourself a feminist yet completely ignore the issues of sexual assault, you know, issues pertaining particularly to women in Sweden and brush them off as, oh, no, 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 they changed the definition of sexual assault. They didn't. They didn't. It is dangerous to be a Swedish woman on the northern fringes of, of, of Stockholm. It's, it's dangerous to be a Swedish woman walking around Gothenburg at night these days. It's dangerous. In fact, I saw a video yesterday 
there was a uh, Swedish expat. She, I think she was living in Norway and she was getting interviewed by a Norwegian journalist. And she was saying, I used to take the Metro to work. I can't anymore. And she was saying that um, you can't walk through the, the subway halls anymore because there are groups of, and she used the words migrant children, 15, 16 year old children who will wait in these halls and snatch your bag or whatever. They'll come into coffee houses and hold a knife up to you and take your phone, that sort of thing. These were these were the words of a woman who experienced it firsthand, who was almost sexual, sexually assaulted if it weren't for a man stepping in, in the middle of Stockholm in the middle of the day. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I find that when uh, the left there confronted uh, with these facts, it's, they don't come up with arguments. They come up, they're, they're masters of excuses, excusing yep, there we go. That's th exactly th th those right. type yeah. of statistics. Well, yeah. uh, no, you're, you're, this is not, a, they'll say this, for example, this is not a uh, Muslim problem. This is a man so, problem. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And, um, you know, and I brought up the argument to this person that I was debating with last night about Sweden. Um, you know, he was saying, oh, well, you know, uh, th this, it's, just, it's just because crime is becoming more prevalent. It's nothing to do with the refugee intake. It's because, and, you know, and he started to say, oh, I think Swedish people should be worried about the rise of neo-Nazis. I'm thinking, like, oh, my gosh, mate. And I, I brought up the argument to him. I said, okay, well, I read a statistic um, uh, just yesterday that said that uh, in Sweden there was an average of four gang-related shooting deaths per year in the 90s. And it's now over 50 per year since, I think, 2010. I said, so what do you have to say about the uh, the rise of Assyrian gangs, um, you know, Iraqi gangs throughout Gothenburg and Malmo and and Stockholm that, that have been rising since the late 90s, since um, about 2009, 2010? He said, and then he, he, he didn't reply for a little while and he came back with a Wikipedia article saying, oh, see, there's this big proportion of Assyrian people who are Christians. They, they, they aren't Muslims. I'm thinking like, what? Why are you suddenly bringing this into... Why are you trying to argue... Oh, no, they're Christians. Yeah. Like, no, that, that, that's not the argument we're talking about. You're trying to take the blame off of Islam and shift it onto Christianity, where there's no... That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's yeah. it's bizarre. Now, uh, you're as you're only 19, yeah. not only have you started a... Facebook page, but you've also gotten uh, politically active. You've mm. joined the uh, Australian Liberty Alliance. So yep, I've become, uh, I've, I've done a bit of stuff with them. A bit of uh, so, yeah. so what's your plans with with them, given that it is a what, state election year? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm still weighing up sort of my position in the, in the ALA. I was um, I was actually offered um, to be a representative for the seat of Fremantle in Perth in the upcoming state election. And now let, let's just. I mean, you, you, you being in Melbourne, Fremantle is a lot like yeah, that. Yeah, I know that Fremantle is yeah. probably the, the most left-wing area yeah, so, of so, Perth. So, so look, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And um, so I, I, what, I, I have been offered this position as um, a representative for the seat of Fremantle in the state election. And um, you know, we know that it's not going to get in immediately in Fremantle, but um, they do need a representative for that seat. And I thought, well, why not? Your, you know, my, my electoral address is still in WA. And, um, I guess I could campaign, but I'm thinking me being here in Melbourne and having all this, um, you know, uni work to do and not being able to be in Perth all the time might hinder that. So I'm not sure at the moment, I'm still debating that maybe in the future. Yeah. That's, oh, you've got a, you've got a whole life, uh, ahead, ahead yeah, of you. And it would make me a very, very young rep. I think it would probably be the youngest in Australian history. I reckon. I don't think there's ever been a 19 year old in a, having a seat in a local government. So. Oh, well, you've certainly uh, made a big impact of, uh, on the on the political scene and also mm. on the the social media scene. So it's been great to chat and get to know you. I'd yeah. encourage uh, all of our uh, viewers and listeners to uh, go and like the the Young Conservative uh, page. And yeah, we'd love to to keep in contact uh, with you. And I'm sure I'll see you at some upcoming other yep. events. No, you will. You'll, you'll see me at. Um, I'll be at the rally for Tommy Robinson on June the 9th. Um, and I'm hoping a lot more people turn up to that. I mean, we had, um, the last rally we had was on a Monday and there were about, what, about 150 people or so that turned up to that on a Monday, 24 hours notice. Some people even closed up their shops. So I'm really, I'm really excited to see the turnout, um, uh, standing for free speech and against injustices like the imprisonment of Tommy Robinson on Saturday, um, 
the amount of people that are expected to turn up, I think, will exceed about 300, 400. So, yeah, yeah. things are changing in Melbourne. Things which are changing. Are people about... are waking up a little bit. Yeah. I'll see you then. Yeah. Well, cheers. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There is still plenty more happening around Melbourne and elsewhere in Australia, which you should all aim to get to. There are more rallies for Tommy Robinson planned this weekend in Australia. If you're in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth or Brisbane, please search Rallies for Tommy Robinson and Free Speech to get the date and location for the rally in your city. Tickets are on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events. Please make sure to grab your place before they sell out by visiting axomatic.events. Lauren and Stefan promise to make a big impact to our national discussion while they are here, and it is certainly about time that we had that. Axomatic is launching with a splash. If you're in Brisbane, you can meet the famous Mama Warrior Against Safe Schools, uh, political posting mama, aka Marae Carancy, in person. She will be appearing at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club at 7pm on Thursday the 21st of June. Tickets can be purchased at axomatic.events slash political posting mama. It has just been announced another big name is on his way down under. Former UKIP leader Nigel Farage is touring in September and visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane and Auckland as well. It is being brought to you by the same people who brought you Milo Live last year. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. This type of event probably matters more now than ever, given the persecution of nationalists we are seeing around the Western world. Uh, the campaign against racism and fascism have been trying to uh, stir up a crowd there by putting up posters around Melbourne saying it's a, a Nazi rally, so it's important that uh, ordinary people uh, turn up to show that there's nothing wrong with being a nationalist. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.